LAC. We represent the interest of the airports in Latin America and the Caribbean. And welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for uh, providing your time to be with us today in this webinar. That generally is a very important webinar since it involves a, an issue, a topic that affects many, many airports in our region. And that is the resilience of the airports to the actions of climate change. And we need to talk about the risks that the airports are facing, not only in specific times when we have a storm or a hurricane. As you well know, our airports are fairly exposed, especially in the Caribbean, in Central America uh, also, and in the North of South America. But also we need to be ready with climate change that is ongoing, as you all know, and it makes the airports to very exposed very exposed. A few years ago, I was the director of Montego Bay Airport in Jamaica. One of the big problems was not only the exposition the airport had to hurricane situations, but that continuous erosion that the coast uh, suffered a few meters away from the airport due to the tides and or the fact that the waves are more aggressive or uh, higher than before. So it's not only due to specific events, but it's in general uh, climate change we're undergoing. We have a, a very lux luxury team together with us. We have Giuliana Scavuzzi, director of in environmental uh, aspects in ACI Montreal. We have John Dengel, vice president of RSNH. We have Rachel Burbridge, from Eurocontrol, Italia Cessin, Director of Environmental uh, Issues, Aspects in El Dorado Airport. Without any further ado, as I said before, we want to welcome you. We want to thank the speakers for their attendance today, and I hope you enjoy their presentations. I will uh, give the floor now to my colleague, Francisco Medela, who will explain how the webinar will operate. Thank you. Thank you, Rafael, for the introduction. Just a couple of housekeeping instructions. Uh, as you know, uh, we have a simultaneous interpretation in all our uh, ACI LAC webinars. To activate the interpretation, you only have to click on the interpretation button that you will, that is located in the Zoom menu. And you have to select the channel of your preference. Uh, and uh, please, in case uh, you want to avoid the overlap between the speaker and interpreter, please select the uh, the last option that says unmute original audio. Regarding the, uh, Q, uh, we will have a Q&A session at the end of the presentations. Um, and for that, the uh, chat uh, function is not going to be enabled. And we kindly ask you to send the questions for the participant, for the speakers uh, to the email address that you will have here on the on the screen, info at acilac.aero. Please include uh, who is the speaker you are uh, addressing the, the, the question to. And uh, without further ado, uh, we would like to uh, invite Juliana to start the presentation that will give uh, the perspective on this topic uh, from, the, from ACI World and the tools available for our members. Thank you, Juliana. Thank you very much, Francisco, and thank you, Rafael, for the introduction and for the invitation. That's a, a great initiative from ACI LAC. And uh, we are going to just touch upon some of the initiatives and how we started to, to do uh, some more work more recently on resilience and adaptation uh, to climate change at ACI World. And uh, please, next slide, uh, Francisco, so we can start. Yeah, so here is just a reminder, right? Right, so why resilience and adaptations are, are both relevant to airports. This is like the classical uh, example of an event, uh, but uh, Rafael well said that uh, we also have the constant and continuous impact of a changing climate on airports, infrastructure, and also on operations. And it's a challenge that not only airports face, but uh, 
the wider uh, uh, industry as well. And as airports, we have to consider that uh, as, as part of our system of aviation and, and even a bit broader as, as we evolve in the knowledge understanding of the topic. Next slide, please, Francisco. So of course, this topic was something that uh, was uh, even before my time at ACI, which is uh, from five years ago, um, we, there was some traction that was gained lately, but uh, the ACI Work Environment Standing Committee was already working on the topic, uh, you know, a uh, long time ago. And then, then it gained traction, I think, for all those events that you, you have heard one of them is the one I just mentioned about Irma, but uh, all over the world, basically, and Asia Pacific as well, a region uh, where we have seen also severe impacts. And the fact that uh, we are starting to, to see also uh, climate change impacts uh, all over and, and different ways that we need to face that. And the, the climate agenda really has, has increased. But in 2018, we have this uh, resolution uh, that is number three of that year, uh, from our uh, General Assembly encouraging Air Force to take action on resiliency and adaptation to climate change. And uh, in between that, you will see that we had uh, developed a policy brief and starting uh, with a survey that we present forward. And in 2020, more recently, um, on the lines of the COVID recovery plans and uh, looking to resilience from a bit of a different perspective that's just beyond climate change, uh, we also had the resolution on the recognizing uh, climate change adaptation and resilience uh, that they should be included as part of uh, recovery plans uh, from airports. And, and those resolutions are available at ACI World website if you'd like to have a look. Next slide, please. So this is the policy brief that was published in uh, 2018, and uh, it has an overall setting of initially um, kind of an assessment, a matrix where you have the climate stressors and the potential impacts. I'll show you very quickly soon that. We also had uh, some share of airports initiatives. We tried to collect uh, globally some examples uh, from airports that have already taken action and uh, the information was available online to facilitate you know, for, for the audience if they wanted to go further uh, in the topic. And we also included some case studies, uh, very interesting ones. Uh, we tried to divide the different types of case studies, but uh, they touch upon preparation as part of a national plan where the airport was part of that. They touch upon cost benefit analysis uh, when doing a, a climate uh, risk assessment and adaptation project. They also touch upon the, the uh, fast recovery and the use of communications in that. And some of the words I'm talking about on these case studies, you will see that are in the recommendations, not only on this policy brief, but also on the resolutions. So uh, the policy brief and the resolutions, they recommend that airports consider to include those risks and uh, the adaptation resilience aspects on their master plan development and to conduct uh, risk and criticality assessments and uh, at er very early stages of the process to make sure that you can implement that if you are uh, designing a new airport, but if you are also uh, doing a new terminal or a new construction or anything that you were planning or changing the planning, you should incorporate that at, you know, as soon as possible because that impacts your overall strategy in the long term, for sure. And that integration should go along, not only, of course, the environment department. We have had interesting discussions in the environment committee from ACI World where we see that the environment, um, people will sit around understanding uh, the potential impacts and kind of flagging that in support of the risk assessment. But the solutions, uh, they need to come from uh, different uh, expertise. And of course, uh, the, the staff and the experts that are related to operations, uh, technical safety and uh, design, construction, all of that. So it's really, um, a holistic approach that an airport has to take as they, they start to work on resilience and adaptation. The next slide, please, uh, Francisco. Here, just to share uh, with you how we divide the potential impacts and uh, the climate stressors. As you can see, sea level rise, increase intensity of storms, temperature change, and so on. But also uh, all the impact on infrastructure and operations that we could foresee at that time for each of those stressors. Of course, this is uh, uh, ongoing knowledge that uh, we are all developing on that. And at some point we may need to revise some of those and include other aspects as well. 
Uh, next slide, please. And here you just see a picture with a sample of airports uh, in the Asia Pacific region because it's just the alphabetical order of the picture I was taking. But that's what I mentioned, you know, where you can find specific examples of uh, initiatives taken and the description. So you may want to go and dive into those. And uh, we are progressing uh, with this work. And more recently, we have decided that we'll be working on uh, a matrix uh, with the Environment Committee uh, at the world level, but also the support from the regions to try to include more and more you know, available uh, risk assessments and adaptation information where we can share those uh, good practices uh, among, among the membership. Next slide, please. And here, uh, you just uh, showing to you uh, kind of uh, two publications from ACI, the purpose being really to try to uh, gather uh, further knowledge on the issue because we published the policy brief and realized that uh, there is a lot of gap in knowledge. We have a discussion at a strategic level uh, with the leadership uh, of ACI and with our board at that time. And one of the questions they ask is that, you know, do we have data from a global perspective on the impact of climate change on airports? The kind of impact, you know, uh, from it, uh, which region, uh, you know, are the most affected? Are they aware of, uh, you know, new initiatives, for instance, like the task force on climate related disclosures that I think John will speak a bit more about that. So uh, having that uh, that understanding that there was a gap in knowledge, the next step was really to do this survey that uh, went to the entire membership. And that's the publication you see there is available at our website and, and John uh, will go further with the details on, on how we did that. And of course that knowledge uh, on, on this the survey and in the data is going to be used to further develop our policy, but also our initiatives and support and capacity building needs uh, for airports and also our engagement that we have with external stakeholders on the topic like IKEO uh, and Eurocontra that you see here as well uh, in, in this webinar. And we more recently on the lines of the uh, COVID crisis and looking to a sustainable recovery uh, uh, arena, we kind of uh, decided to do a survey and we did that with the support from ICF uh, to the financing sector, trying to understand if anything has changed in terms of uh, climate impacts, uh, in terms of their view uh, for risk assessments of their investments and finance options. And uh, they actually, uh, the response was that uh, among the, the respondents, 70% said that, you know, sustainability criteria, including, of course, climate change aspects and risk were included already in, in their assessments. And 50% of those said they believe they, this will increase. And we are already seeing this trend uh, increased. And you can find that publication as well at our website. And next slide, please, Francisco. And I think before I, I uh, leave the floor to John, just uh, as we have been discussing all about COVID and, and how do you think that has impacted uh, resilience and, and what we think that we should do. And uh, based on discussions that we have been having with, with different people, experts, members, stakeholders, we realize that uh, COVID has actually forced us to uh, look into our risks from a different perspective, right? Uh, the airport infrastructure, and the operations were ready to be uh, deployed and they were not disrupted by any climate event, but there was no passengers and there was no flights. So we realized uh, uh, quite soon and that uh, it's something that we have already been talking, but uh, from a wider perspective on, on different areas, that resilience is a discussion that, uh, you know, merits uh, a point from every single area when you're looking to airport uh, operation planning. Uh, in infrastructure design. And not only aviation, right? Uh, we are a network uh, sector that is, is global, is highly dependent on each stakeholder to make sure that things are happening in a good flow. And that's the case uh, when you have a delay just because of climate change impact or more adverse weather right now, which is an immediate impact that we can see more broadly, widely that impact and have no cone effects on, on all the chain and on airports that maybe are not in a region where that is a problem. And COVID also made us, uh, you know, look more in detail more, more about, you know, the people aspect and uh, the supply chain, local supply chain because of uh, the challenge we faced with COVID and 
that resilience aspect, of course, should be worked together with the policy developments of governments and uh, strategic collaboration that go further beyond uh, the aviation sector and airports are uh, this interface also between different uh, you know modes of transportation. So I'll place on that. And there is the disaster uh, management uh, relief community, and they also have a lot of knowledge on immediate impacts and how to assess those. And uh, we we believe that uh, we we can learn a lot from what they're doing on, on their immediate attention, and we can exchange as well. So we don't need to reinvent the wheel. There's a lot of knowledge there, but we need to integrate more and talk more about uh, the resilience aspect not only from a climate change perspective. And of course, mitigation of climate change has been something that we have been doing, um, mostly separated from adaptation. We're reducing carbon. And uh, sometimes we've, we've used to find opportunities to combine those, but I think more and more it's becoming more an imperative that we make sure that uh, we, while we're planning our mitigation, we're implementing that with uh, resilience aspects uh, and adaptation considerations. So without further ado, I will I'll uh, pass the floor to John and I'll thank you for your attention and I'm happy to address questions uh, later on. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Juliana. Buenos dias, everyone. Um, today I'm going to talk a little bit about the ACI Climate Change Resilience and Adaptation Survey that Juliana mentioned. I'm also going to talk a little bit about the Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosure, which was one of the findings of the survey that we felt uh, some additional outreach and education would be beneficial. So if you go to the next slide, please. Starting out with the survey results, we've received survey results from over 288 airports. This was found in 121 responses. So a large number of respondents operate several airports, and we see that around the, around the, uh, the world. Um, in Latin America and the Caribbean, we had 18 responses, which represented about 78 airports. So it was a great response rate. We're very pleased with that. It was just between um, 7 and 8 percent of the, the survey uh, surveys that were sent out to individuals. So it was a, a really great response rate, and we appreciate everybody taking the time to prepare the responses. Can you go to the next slide, please? So the survey consisted of five primary categories, and, and the questions were organized in a yes, no, multiple choice, and had open uh, response areas provided. The five categories included climate impacts and understanding um, if folks feel like they've been already affected by, by climate change or severe weather events. We then asked about risk and vulnerability assessments and if folks have proceeded with conducting some level of assessment. Uh, we looked at climate-related financial decisions and, and tried to understand uh, sort of the impacts of those financial disclosures and how they might uh, affect what an airport does in the future. We then asked about insurance and if insurance has been affected by some of those climate change effects. And lastly, we asked about cap capacity building. And as Juliana mentioned, you know, ACI is a is is a key element of their mission is to provide uh, capacity guidance and, and opportunities for information sharing. If you go to the next slide, please. So as we dive into the results and, and uh, the five categories, overall from, a, from an airport's perspective, so thinking of those 288 airports that were represented by those 121 responses, we saw that overall 63% uh, felt that they were already being impacted by severe weather events. Uh, we saw that 58% um, had conducted some level of risk or vulnerability assessment. A few uh, folks, less than 30% were aware of financial disclosure initiatives that were out there, particularly the task force on climate related financial disclosure. And even fewer had, had um, understanding of if there were insurance implications of climate change effects on their operations and their facilities. Uh, we, you'll note that a, a fairly large amount, 13% were unsure. And we believe that perhaps some of that uncertainty was centered around um, that the, in, uh, uh, the survey was sent to individuals that may not have had access to folks that understood, understood where insurance was at their facilities and, and maybe weren't able to get that kind of information from their internal processes. And then the last item, um, nearly 60% of the respondents and of the airports um, indicated that they would be interested in external support on this issue. So that was a great, a great turnout of, of information and, and useful uh, data to be used in the future. Uh, the next slide, please. 
So if we break this down by the regions, um, thinking about impacted uh, adverse weather events, you know, we saw that uh, Latin America, North America, and Africa were all in the same range, about 70% had already had some kind of severe impacts uh, as a result of weather. Um, Europe had a, a little bit less, they were around 50%, and Asia Pacific was considerably higher, almost 90% of their airports um, and the respondents that, that prepared their responses to the questionnaire felt like they were impacted by adverse weather events today. So that's pretty telling as to which airports are, are most impacted at this point. Next slide, please. Now, if we break that down to what type of adverse weather events and our conditions they may have been exposed to, um, we found that uh, precipitation and, and intense storms were the primary um, uh, types of weather events that, that folks were exposed to. Uh, there was a little, disc a little uh, several uh, folks identified extreme temperatures and um, even less identified wind patterns. And you can see the other categories that really surprisingly, um, for example, sea level rise was not a, a significant impact yet, but that's also telling because it means that sea level rise is not has not started to occur as significantly as it's expected to occur. And, and people are really starting to see storm events and precipitation and higher winds being much more significant um, today. The next slide, please. As we drill in a little bit further into the Latin American Caribbean region of ACI, we see similar results as it, as it was for the overall um, category by the different uh, regions. We see changes in intensity of storms, changing precipitation, and high wind patterns are really driving the issues and they're associated with, with storm events. Um, interestingly enough, changes in biodiversity has not been seen, although one, one respondent did indicate that changes in biodiversity are, are occurring today. That was quite interesting. Next slide, please. So you think about the adverse weather events that occur and the types of storms and so forth, and you, you ask, well, what, what was the impact of those types of weather events? And far, far, um, far more significant was the dis disruption in operations. Uh, most operations uh, have been impacted um, in most regions of the, of the world. And um, there were some that also experienced um, damage to infrastructure. So that was quite critical and important to, uh, to understand. If you go to the next slide, please. You'll see that as we looked at, at those folks that had impacts, we asked if they would be vulnerable to those, um, if they've assessed whether or not they had vulnerabilities uh, to those particular impacts. And in this case, we're, we're summarizing the data by both the respondents and by the airports. And you can see for all of the regions that were responding, about 42% had conducted, 42% of the respondents had conducted a risk or vulnerability assessment. By comparing by airport and looking at the airports that are represented by those respondents, over 58% had done some type of risk or vulnerability assessment. And we looked at the Latin American Caribbean region of those respondents and airports that were represented about 100%, all of the, all the facilities had done subtype of risk and vulnerability assessment, which is fantastic. Um, if we then looked at further, if, if you answered yes to that question, we asked, well, if uh, you did an assessment, did you do that yourself or was it done in cooperation with a government agency or did the government agency conduct the assessment for you? And we found that from a respondent perspective, half of the respondents said that, that um, they had been doing the assessments themselves. And, but for those that did the assessments themselves, that only represented about 28% of the airports in that whole group within the Latin American Caribbean region. So most of the assessments that were done, if you look at it from an airport basis, was done um, by a third party or government agency or in collaboration with a government agency. The last question we asked here um, was, would you be willing to share the results with ACI? And thankfully, 12 airports did indicate that they would be, would be willing to share the assessment results. And if you recall, looking back at uh, Juliana shared a matrix where we were gathering information from other airports, we certainly would appreciate anybody willing to share uh, their assessment results, again, for information sharing. And we can keep you know, certain elements confidential and, and not sharing necessarily specific locations, but definitely the, the outcomes and the, the impacts that were identified are very important for folks to share and, and learn from those experiences. The next slide, please. 
So the next category was really talking about the financial disclosures and those financial disclosures related to climate related or climate change risks. And it was interesting to see that um, most folks were not aware of the Financial Stability Board or the Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosure and what the initiative was about. Um, so that was quite interesting to see. And we did see um, of those folks that answered this question in the positive, we saw that three cases, um, they were asked externally to respond to or to disclose information regarding climate related risks. So um, it's, a, it's a small amount, but it is starting and we're starting to see more and more where financial institutions, insurance agencies are starting to ask the questions about what are your climate related uh, exposures. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned on the insurance side where people are starting to ask, um, we've not yet seen that translate um, into uh, adverse conditions to your insurance terms and conditions. So um, there was only a few um, in North America and Asia Pacific that, that affirmed that they have seen some changes in their insurance terms, but otherwise, generally speaking, there haven't been a lot of changes in insurance terms as of yet. And this may be because insurance tends to be written at a three to five year time cycle. So um, most, most insurance companies just haven't yet caught up to the issue of climate change, but we understand that it is coming. Next uh, slide, please. So the, the, the last slide was, would you like some external support from ACI or government entities or others on climate adaptation and resilience? And we saw, and uh, I'll say generally that uh, about 50% or just under 50% if you look uh, worldwide are looking for some additional guidance. Um, it's interesting the developing areas of Latin America and Africa are certainly looking and seeking for more um, support in the development of their climate adaptation resiliency efforts. Specific areas of assistance, if you look on the right side of the slide, uh, you'll see strategy. You know, that's very important to folks. How do you approach looking at climate vulnerabilities and looking at uh, infrastructure and operational changes? Uh, guidance and training is very important, and, and a lot of that will be, uh, will be provided and then technical and financial uh, assistance. Next slide, please. So overall, from a conclusions perspective, um, the survey provided some really great insight at the global scale as well as the regional scale of what can be expected from a climate change impact perspective. Um, approximately 70% globally um, have been impacted by adverse weather conditions with uh, certain regions like uh, Asia Pacific having almost 90% having some type of impact already. Uh, collaboration between the airport operators and stakeholders is very, very important when you come to developing risk and vulnerability assessments. Uh, everybody really has to work together as a team to come together and, and understand what the vulnerabilities are and how to address the vulnerabilities. Um, airports are definitely interested in getting support from ACI, and ACI is definitely interested in providing support to uh, its members. Um, though that support can come in the form of best management practices, um, training, identifying funding mechanisms, which is a key element. Um, funding is absolutely needed to help people address climate change awareness and so forth. Um, and then, uh, you know, there are some financing implications and you know we need to continue to raise awareness and, and we'll do a, talk about that here in a moment and then lastly you know this as as juliana mentioned there's going to be uh, this data will be used to help aci really provide a data-driven response and provide appropriate policy and guidance going forward with with uh, external stakeholders particularly on the advocacy side so if we go to the next slide we want to talk a little bit about the Financial Stability Board and the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosure. Uh, the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosure, or TCFD, was formed in 2016. Um, and it has today over 200, I'm sorry, 2,000 public and private sector supporters. And the real aim of this particular effort is to become to allow climate change effects and climate change mitigation strategies to really become commonplace in financial disclosure. And, and what that means is that, that they're really trying to be as transparent as possible and help markets become more and more secure and stable and not be so adversely impacted by the effects of climate change or the, the effects of a changing climate. So when it comes to carbon and things of that nature, 
And um, they've come up with a number of guidance documents. You can see on the right-hand side uh, the, the guidance that's, that's provided. There is um, a number of risk identified. There's not only risk, but there's opportunities. And so if you think about energy, energy consumption, you know, by implementing uh, programs to reduce greenhouse gases, you may reduce your energy consumption. So not only looking at risk of climate change on your infrastructure and operation, but also looking at opportunities. Uh, strategic planning and risk management, there's guidance on that. And then what are the final financial implications of those particular risks and how will you address those implications going forward? Um, if you go to the next slide, uh, Francisco, uh, there's a little more data provided on how they've identified, how they've laid out the disclosure recommendations and, and what they'd like to see in specific disclosures. The first item is governance. And this is where your organization from top to bottom really understands the issue and is looking at the climate related risks and opportunities. Strategy is the next item where they're trying to understand, well, how have you come about to understand what your climate related risks are? And, and, or, and as well as opportunities, and how might that uh, inform the strategy to address those risks, but also the strategy for how that affects your financial well being. Uh, they talk about risk management and provide guidance on how to disclose within the organization and assess and manage your climate related risks and through a risk management process. Um, and then lastly, they're, they're interested in metrics and targets and what metrics and targets do you use in that assessment of risk and what are your goals? And, and um, they're looking at establishing metrics and targets that will be consistent throughout the industry so that there is a good comparison uh, amongst various stakeholders. If you go to the next slide, please, you'll see um, these are documents that were recently released, released as of October, 2020. Um, the one in the center is the status report, and this is a report that's done every year where they talk about their membership, they talk about the activities that they've conducted, and it's a great read on understanding where TCFD is today. Um, they've also released the other three documents that I'm highlighting here are guidance documents. Uh, the two to the right are a guidance on scenario analysis and how do you look at the variability associated with climate change. The one on the far right is a guidance on risk management. And this is looking at risk management strategies. What are the different methods for going through and identifying risks and, and trying to address those um, risks as you integrate them into your, into your systems and then ultimately disclose those risks. The last document on the left is uh, forward, it's indicated forward looking financial sector, sector metrics. And this was a survey that they issued um, to members as well as other, uh, non-governmental agencies or people interested in this topic area. And they released uh, the re survey results um, to try to understand what should the metrics be for assessing um, financial implications of climate change. And if you go to the next slide, you'll see one of the survey results, which was, um, you know, what is the, what were the, some of the metrics that some of the respondents were, were indicating? And it's interesting to look at those. Uh, the first category is forward-looking metrics laid out in the document that I just uh, spoke to. Most of those metrics are centered around um, climate change mitigation or carbon and reducing carbon or what's the cost of your carbon producing activities and uh, carbon using um, operations. So it's, it's interesting to see that most of the metrics indicated even if you look down at the uh, forward-looking metrics um, mentioned by respondents, there's one bullet at the very end that really speaks to the impacts of climate change on your operations, um, physical regulatory transition risks related to climate change. And most of the other elements are associated on greenhouse gas emissions, carbon counting and, and things of that nature. So it's an interesting uh, look. Again, the people that responded to these are the financial institutions. So apparently they're seeing the pressure on the carbon, carbon market, market side of the house. If you go to the next slide, I'll finish with um, a note regarding the UN Conference on Trade and Development. They've been working for many years um, on the small island developing states, um, particularly in the Caribbean. I presume several of the folks on the call today may have participated in these as a result of uh, some case studies that were developed. Um, it's a, they've produced a number of really 
important, I think, and excellent guidance documents that, that address both um, what people have done with respect to looking at climate-related risks, looking at uh, vulnerabilities and how they might address those vulnerabilities going forward. They identified some challenges um, specific to the region, looking at information and data and, and something that can be downscaled to the particular islands that they're, they're investigating. And then really the challenge associated with cooperation and coordination um, amongst the, the uh, various uh, folks in that region to help come up with a unified strategy to address the, the, the issue which affects each of the islands, um, most similarly, but in some cases a little bit differently. So I've provided the, uh, the uh, website that you can go and you can see all the different guidance documents that are available. So with that, I'll close and uh, thank you very much. Thank you, John, for the presentation. Uh, just uh, a quick reminder for those who have uh, joined a bit late. Uh, as you can see, the, the chat function is not enabled. So please send your questions for the uh, speakers to the email address that you will see in the screen, info at acilac.aero, and we will have the Q&A just after the, the presentations. Uh, now is the turn of Rachel Burbage from, from Eurocontrol that will give us a shared experience on, on this topic. Thank you, Rachel. Hello. Thank you, Francisco. Hello, everybody. I'd just like to say thank you very much to ACI LAC for the invitation to be here today. Um, I'm really delighted to be here to talk about adapting airports to changing climate with you all. So next slide, please. So this next slide will just give you a quick idea of what we're going to talk about in this part of the webinar. So Juliana has told us about the work ACI are doing in this area. And John has shown us the results of their recent survey, which I think it's very promising that 288 airports are have responded to the survey and that really shows the level of engagement we're starting to get here. And so now I'm going to go on to talk a little bit about some of the actual climate change risks for airports and how we can adapt and build resilience to those risks. Uh, next slide, please. So very quickly, because I realize some of you may not be familiar with the organization I'm representing, uh, Eurocontrol is the European organization for the safety of air traffic management. We are an intergovernmental organization with 41 member states and our main role is to help our member states or support our member states in the safe and efficient management of European airspace and that includes sustainability, uh, adaptation and resilience. Uh, next slide please. So we've been working on adapting aviation to a change climate since 2008. In that time, we've produced a number of studies and analyses. And I'm very excited that actually next month in June, we should be releasing a new study, which looks at quantifying some of the impacts of climate change for aviation, looking at sea level rise as changes in intensity and frequency of storms and potential changes in traffic demand. Uh, next slide, please. So here you can see some of the potential climate impacts for airports. I must say this is not an exhaustive list. There are unfortunately many more, um, but this is to give you an idea. And I just need to stress that the impacts that an airport might be at risk of will vary greatly according to where the airport is um, and how the climate was at the base climate and how the climate might change. But we might see impacts from changes in precipitation, sea level rise, at temperature extremes, for example. And those impacts can affect operations, infrastructure, safety, and there can also be business and economic impacts. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so just to look at a couple of those impacts in a little bit more detail, uh, we've talked about temperature changes. This is mainly changes in uh, or an increase in average and extreme temperatures, but it could also be some unexpected cold spells in regions that don't normally experience that. Uh, we've certainly had that in Europe in the last couple of years. 
Um, but higher average and extreme temperatures might cause heat damage to infrastructure. You might need an increased cooling requirement. And you might also see changes in tourism demand patterns. Uh, if, for example, you start to see much higher temperatures at uh, popular tourist destinations in peak tourist season. Uh, next slide, please. So for changes in precipitation, uh, this is most likely to be an increase in frequency intensity of precipitation. It can be snow in unexpected locations or more positively for some locations, perhaps a decrease in snow. Uh, this can disrupt operations, it can lead to flooding, and it could also even lead to um, impacts on ground transport access for people and employees getting to the airport. But more positively, you might see a decrease in snow clearance and the ice requirements. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so storms, we're expecting to see more intense storms, possibly more frequent storms. Uh, this can unfortunately disrupt operations, which leads to delays, reroutings, route extensions, and of course, in turn, that can lead to additional fuel burn and additional CO2 emissions. Uh, if we get much stronger storms, we might also see more damage to infrastructure. Uh, Juliana showed us the, uh, the photo right at the beginning of the, the uh, damage from Hurricane Irma. Uh, next slide, please. So, and finally, uh, sea level rise and storm surge. Uh, this would be a particular issue for coastal airports or um, airports on low-lying islands. Um, if you have sea level rise or storm surge, you might have a permanent or a temporary loss of airport capacity, uh, which of course then has a knock-on effect of delay and disruption if the runway is flooded and you can't be used. And it can also lead to costs to implement uh, sea defences to protect against that. Right, next slide, please. So to start to build resilience and prepare for these risks, the best place to start is usually seen as carrying out a risk assessment. So for this, you need to have an idea of how the climate is going to change in your location. Uh, you also need to think about who needs to be involved in the risk assessment. And it's often seen as an environmental issue, but it, it's much broader than that. It's operational, it's safety, it's business, it's technical, as Juliana mentioned in her presentation. So you need to make sure you have the right people involved. And you also need to probably look wider than just the airport itself, because there may be impacts to ground transport access, for example, or even interruptions to utilities supply. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So if you need to understand how the local climate might change, you probably need to work with your local MET services to get those, those future forecasts and to understand what that means. Uh, to build the team, you need, you need to um, identify who is actually the, the responsible person or department, but then look more widely to see who needs to be involved. So you might need to bring in your operational people, your safety people, and you may also want to work with the key airlines at your airport as well. And I think it's quite important to get senior leadership commitment because this gives viability, credibility, to carrying out this work and it also helps to secure resources. Um, then you need to identify the risk assessment methodology that you're going to use. Uh, you could use the airport's existing risk assessment methodology and expand that, or you might want to use a specific climate change risk assessment methodology. Uh, there are some out there, I'll show you some links at the end. John just spoke about the UNCTAD guidance, which is very useful. Um, or you could use something that's been developed and published by an airport that's already done an, um, an assessment. And it's also very little important to look at whether there's any legislation that needs to be complied, any standards that need to be met. Uh, next slide, please. So 
once you've identified your risk assessment methodology, then you can work through applying that methodology to identify the potential impacts and vulnerabilities that you may need to address. In particular, any critical safety and operational risks that may affect uh, safety and service levels at the airport. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So basically what you want to find out is what could happen, how likely or how probable is that to happen, and what are the consequences if it does happen? So you, one of the things you can use is a risk assessment matrix, like the one on the, uh, the right hand side of the slide. Uh, this was developed by Heathrow Airport in the United Kingdom. And uh, they map out the potential risks they might experience, how confident they, they think that it is that that risk will actually happen. And then they apply a risk score based on the consequences of that risk happening. Uh, Juliana also showed us in her presentation a really useful tool, the matrix developed by ACI, which works as a checklist to go through and look at potential impacts and whether you think you might be affected by them. Uh, next slide, please. So once you've gone through your risk assessment methodology and you've identified the potential risks and challenges you might have to address, then it's time to start developing a climate adaptation plan, a set of measures or actions to address those risks of challenges. I'll talk about this a little bit more in a moment. But one thing to highlight here is that in most cases there probably might not be resources to do everything that you want or need to do. So you do need to prioritize which are the most critical elements. And another key thing is that you, it, you should periodically review the plan uh, and the adaptation measures that you've implemented because you need to check that they're fit for purpose, that they are working. And also the uh, climate impacts, they might happen more quickly or differently to what has been forecast. So it's important to carry out these periodic reviews and keep a bit of flexibility. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, and just to emphasize again, the importance of the collaboration across the airport. Uh, they do really need to bring in people, all key people that are needed. Right, next slide, please. Okay, so when it comes to uh, looking at adaptation and resilience measures, it's a bit like looking at the potential risks and impacts that you might be affected by. It will really vary according to the airport itself, its, um, its location, the climate impacts it's expecting, its business model, and also it, its level of risk appetite, how much risk is it prepared to take. Uh, but for example, if an airport is at risk from sea level rise, you might be allow, able to allow some amount of safe inundation. You might need to invest in sea defences, or in really extreme cases, you might need to think about uh, relocation. And if you're expecting an increase in heavy precipitation, you more, more also more frequent precipitation, you might want to think about um, enlarging your drainage capacity to cope with more water. Uh, you might need to think about whether you can protect your ground transport links from flooding, for example. Uh, if you're expecting an increase in temperatures, you might need to think about whether your cooling demand is sufficient, or sorry, your cooling capability is sufficient, or whether you need to increase that to cope with an increased demand. Uh, next slide, please. So just a few points to finish up. There are so a couple of key things to think about. Um, this will be different for every airport. It's really a, a business um, decision, but how and when should you act to start to take action to build resilience? Um, so you really, there's a balance here between under and over adaptation. So doing too little too late and incurring costs and damages or doing too much too soon and um, perhaps spending, investing in measures that you don't need to take. 
So it's important that any decisions are based on good information. Uh, we often say that preemptive action is beneficial because you reduce future damages and costs, but that action needs to be well informed by good information to make sure it, it's well targeted. Um, there is also a balance between cost and resilience. Um, it's probably impossible to be 100% resilient to every possible climate change impact. And in any case, it would be prohibitively expensive, I suspect. Uh, so you need to really identify which are your most critical elements uh, for your safety and your service levels, and then to prioritize those. Um, so next slide, please. So that there is quite a lot to think about, and we unfortunately in the time we have, we can't really go into it in so much detail, but I hope that's sort of given you an idea of the sort of things that you, you, you can think about, you need to think about when you're starting to carry out risk assessment, climate change risk assessment, and develop an adaptation plan. So on the last slide, I've just put a few resources that I hope would be useful. And Juliana already showed us the ACI information that's available. Uh, the Airport Cooperative Research Program is based in the United States and they've produced some quite good guidance on airport climate change risk assessment and adaptation planning. Uh, ICAO last year released a climate change adaptation synthesis, which brings together a, a wealth of existing information on climate change impacts and adaptation. And you can look at existing climate adaptation plans from other airports. There are quite a few that are in the public domain. And perhaps what I'm most excited about is that in ICAO, in the Committee on Aviation and Environmental Protection, we have been working on guidance on climate change risk assessment and adaptation planning for aviation organisations. Uh, John has also been quite heavily involved in this work, as has Juliana and ACI. Uh, we've been working on it for about two, two and a half years now, and this should be ready for publication in early 2021. 20, sorry, 2022, that is a typo right at the end there. <laughs> okay, so last slide, please. Uh, that, that's it from me. Um, I think we'll have plenty of time for questions in the Q&A session, but you're also very welcome to follow up with me if you have any uh, particular questions, and that's my email address right there. Thank you very much. Uh, with that, I will hand back to Francisco. Thank you, Rachel, for the presentation. And now is the turn of Tania Chassin from Bogota Airport that will share with us the Climate Change Committee established at El Dorado Airport. But just before starting with Tania's presentation, just to remind you that uh, the press, the press you have to send uh, the questions to the uh, email address that you find on screen, info at acilac.aero for the Q&A &A session that will take place after Tania's presentation. And now, can start with Tania and your presentation. Gracias, Francisco. You. Thank you, Francisco, for the opportunity. I want to initially thank uh, ACI for the invitation, for allowing us to tell you about the strategy we have for climate change. All sectors have challenges, and we are working on, on climate change aspects. It's a world uh, aspect and we are all aware the, our industries and we cannot be uh, we can have drawbacks here it's a challenge in opain we have addressed this in the following manner we have a strategy for climate change we did this together with quacks we did not do it by ourselves we have cross-section uh, objectives as a group we are part of the entrepreneurial group that has three sectors, the cement group, infrastructure, transportation, and an energy groups. We worked on, uh, we had work tables in order to uh, anticipate challenges, opportunities to create synergies, establish objectives, generate awareness, and strengthen internal capacities. I will stop in two basic components of the four we identified, mitigation, compensation, adaptation, communications. I will stop in two basic ones, mitigation, which is reducing uh, CO2 uh, 
emissions and compensation to compensate for CO2 emissions. What are we committed to? In this photograph uh, in El Dorado Airport, we have wetlands around. These are uh, strategic ecosystems for us that we are protecting. And we're doing it through these objectives that we have here, targets to uh, protect them, uh, to reduce CO2 emissions by up to 18%. In 2025, we want to have carbon neutrality. We're also working today in assessing strategic risks. We're also working in implementing strategies to protect ecosystems for business sustainability. We want to uh, manage holistically risk and climate change opportunities. We want to analyze viability to be zero net by uh, 2050. To uh, fly is something recurrent. What well, we airports become areas that create surprising connections. And today we're being tested. There's more awareness in the world and there, there are more challenges. We must be uh, at the proper level so people keep flying. So people feel relaxed to travel by air and we must be committed on sustainability, watching over our natural resources. And thereby we have identified these risks and opportunities. OPAIN counts with the risk management system where we identified strategic risks and operational risks. We also have vulnerability analyses. We've been working on this for more than seven years. We use guidelines of the Intergovernmental Board for Climate Change. The task force includes financial institutions, as John mentioned, TCFD, and we categorize two types of risks, physical risks, those derived from climate change, and transition risks, those derived from the transition process towards a low CO2 economy. This would generate changes in policies, regulations, and technology and markets, as John mentioned and Rachel mentioned. Here we have these three. We have identified what we've been working on. We have challenges, but we're working with technical commissions on more strict uh, regulations. We're committed on better infrastructure. We're mapping out the weaknesses in infrastructure due to uh, climate change impacts. And we are working on changing specifications to be more resilient. We have extreme climate uh, changes. We have uh, uh, different traffic situations. We have different tourism patterns. This has uh, obligated that we verify the changing demand in passengers. We also have uh, uh, alternative fuels uh, and alternative electricity and power in different uh, vehicles. We also have a physical risk, the deterioration of the ecosystems uh, around our airports affect us greatly. Here we see a clear example. These are photographs of the airport in 2011, where we were impacted by a Niña phenomenon because it flooded one of the runways. So we had to uh, change the threshold of the runway due to uh, more precipitation. And uh, we've been working on, on these aspects. How have we been working on this? Besides what I told you about our management uh, operation system today with with different businesses and Transforma, we worked on two types of analyses, sensibility analyses that seeks to qualify how sensitive uh, the different stages are that an airport has in infrastructure. Uh, when we have construction uh, and maintenance and if there's a climate change event and this uh, diagram, this graph cho shows us that in the airport, we have a low sensibility and we identified 283 consequences for these stages of the value chain that could, that could be affected by threatening agents that I will show you later on. 
This is the capacity analysis where we evaluated the resources that OPAIN has to absorb the possible uh, climate change impacts or to go back to the operations without great uh, implications. We, we define implications in order to face uh, uh, climate change aspects, infrastructure, uh, applicable norms, conditions, and technology development. Here we can see that in OPAIN on the red uh, line here, we can see we have a very high capacity to face climate change. When we do uh, these two analyses, we have to relate the degree of vulnerability due to climate change in each one of the stages. Here we have the stages for the value chain of the airport and the climate change, uh, climate threats uh, that we've had uh, and some risks. But nonetheless, we've made changes in our infrastructure and we have identified these risks. We have re revised them and we are looking into opportunities. So this degree of vulnerability now is low in general, but we are still working along these strategic lines. And one of these strategic lines are resilient operations. Currently, the world talks about resilience. The crisis uh, in the pandemic has challenged us as a sector. We have questions on how to be better, how to be reborn, and we have been capable of, uh, capable of doing it during the crisis. We're still committed on being resilient. In, in, in the pandemic, we uh, implemented a project, Retrofit, where we changed almost 14,000 units. Uh, we went from uh, up, up to uh, lead technology, and we have solar panels. So we've reduced 12% our en of our energy consumption in the terminal, and we're committed uh, on further reductions. We're also committed in improving our climatization or cooling uh, systems. We have solar panels in the, uh, around the perimeter too. These are all improvements that we have implemented, especially uh, due to climate change adaptation. We are being pioneers in our country in the airport sector due to our mitigation measures. We are referenced. This is our closest neighbor. This is the most important river in our city, in Bogota, the capital city of Colombia. We're around the airport. We have these uh, five wetlands. They are our key instrument for the main ecology uh, system of our city and for the continuity of our operations. Well, to have such a close neighbor uh, demands from us uh, a more responsible management here. So we count with mitigation adaptation strategies and we're strengthening regulations and impacts on the environment. With all the projects we're working on, so we are uh, controlling floods. So when we protect these wetlands, we protect them because they're very important in our fauna and flora. How can we empower these ecosystems we have? Since, well, we're committed in, in our circular economy and biodiversity, another strategy for territorial or reorganization are the different strategies we have where we transmit knowledge and awareness. So this will contribute to have a better implementation of common strategies for sustainable uh, uh, situations with climate change. So we have entrepreneurial tables with different sectors. We have an interdisciplinary committee at the airport as uh, Rachel mentioned, it's important to have uh, to be close to our close interest groups, external, internal. This interdisciplinary group of OPAIN is involved in different areas like maintenance infrastructure, sustainability area, financial areas, legal areas. 
because we're working to fight climate change. And as, I'm, as I was saying, we need to, uh, we, we are not alone here. We are creating alliances, forging alliances with different entities, public, private, uh, academia, our entrepreneurial groups. We are all struggling or uh, going towards uh, to fight the same challenge. We're trying to uh, raise strategies initiatives as the ones I mentioned to promote responsible interaction with water resources, to promote circular economies. We're taking advantage of 56% of the residues that are produced in the airport. And this initiative makes it that we mitigate uh, greenhouse uh, effects because we are using all these residues. We also promote the conservation of these strategic ecosystems that help us to prevent that these uh, climate uh, problems affect the operations of our airport. And finally, we are also talking about economic resilience to have investment uh, strategies. We need to strengthen this with all our interest groups with our uh, leasers at the airports, with academia. We need to look for viability in all these projects with common objectives, focused towards adaptation to climate change. Thank you very much. This is what I wanted to show you. These are the, uh, the links you can see in Opain's uh, page. You can find videos in there that will show you about our results from our initiatives and strategies. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tania. Very interesting presentation. It's now the turn from, for the Q&A session. Please, as a reminder, send the, your questions to the, to the email address you, that you will find on the screen, info at acilac.aero. We have re received some of them. Uh, I will make the first one uh, and it's about funding. Uh, and I think it's for all our speakers. Um, the question says, finding the money is most often the main issue. How can we secure funding to put in place adaptation and mitigation measures? I don't know who wants to start. Perhaps Juliana, go ahead. Yes, uh, I, I can give it a try, Francisco. So yes, that's, I think, the, the elephant in the room, right? And it's almost like a chicken and egg question because uh, lately we're seeing that uh, without a risk assessment and without, you know, disclosure and your risk is becoming more and more uh, less uh, probable that you're going to be receiving funds and investment. Uh, there is also the, the fact that uh, sustainable uh, development and uh, sustainable airports it's becoming more and more cost efficient and, and there are cost benefits on that. But uh, getting the funds uh, in the first place, if you don't have to conduct those assessments and to look into resilience from a holistic approach that, that just Tanya showed uh, as, as relevant as it is in, in her excellent presentation, I think is, is, is the question when you don't have where to start. So I think that's where capacity building uh, should come in, in in places where there is no fund at all and uh, you need to start uh, looking to your stakeholders and, and try to identify with whom you could partner, you know, if there is, it is your government or if is, there is another organization that is interesting, you know, there has interest in your airport that would support and uh, look into development banks, uh, opportunities for that because there are funds that are specifically designed for that source and understanding that uh, if you don't do that, it will become more and more difficult to actually get funds uh, at all. And uh, as you plan in the long term, your airport development, uh, you need to take that into consideration. But again, it's a chicken and egg question. So if we don't have the money to do in the first place, uh, we want to be able to have that uh, to get the, you know, the progress on, on the rest that we need. So this is a call for support, I would say, from uh, airports, but also other stakeholders uh, that for that uh, issue, which is a big issue, um, and that uh, we believe governments uh, should step in. 
anyone else that would like to add, uh, please? I would echo Juliana's um, thoughts on, you know, having some starting point where you can identify your risk and the the cost of of inaction, and the the implications of um, to your operations, to the community, to the business community of of having vulnerabilities. You know, may also help to to secure uh, local government or even local business funding. Um, because of the implications that that you're able to identify, it's it's obviously very uh, very sp specific to your region and to your situation, but that may be an, an opportunity. I think more and more we're seeing that that the economic. I, mean, I think COVID and the pandemic has really shown that airports are economic drivers, and so leveraging that economic driver ship, let's call it, um, for uh, getting investment from within your community may be, may be a, a source of, of funding. And uh, if I may, I think uh, Juliana and John already gave a very comprehensive answer there. Perhaps just one thing to add that if you can link building um, adaptation, developing adaptation measures, building resilience into ongoing infrastructure improvements or operational improvements, then this can be a cost effective way to integrate it with other projects. So to look at it holistically as part of on ongoing work, uh, so as to utilize or maximize use of budgets to also work towards resilience. Thank you, Rachel. I don't know, Tania, if you want to add something. A mí me gusta. Sí, también me gustaría. Como les, como les well, I would like, uh, as I mentioned in my lights, my last slide, is that we need to forge alliances with the government, academia, where we can uh, work on co-creation projects to see which projects or what projects we have and how we can collaborate so these projects become a reality we cannot do this alone or by ourselves we're all involved here we must have these synergies with the different institutions associations also with the help of aci that is working hard so we can see how to work on these projects and that the financial models uh, are sustainable so we can uh, do it. Gracias, Tania. I would just, if I, if I may add something. Yeah. Um, Please. Uh, Francisco, I'll, I'll put in the chat for, for us and then you can share with the group there is, and, and I'm not intimately familiar with it, but the Caribbean Development Bank has established a green climate fund. I don't know if someone may have had experience with that, but I understand that that is a, an organization that is intended to help um, develop. This is for the Caribbean region, so it obviously it doesn't cover the whole audience, but it may be an option for folks to consider. Thank you, John. Yes, we'll, we will share it with the, with the participants in later. Uh, we have another question uh, that partially was covered by Tania uh, uh, on the previous one, and it says, how can we engage other aviation and non-aviation stakeholders to work with us on the topic of resilience and adaptation? Where do we start? I think Tanya said it all in her last <laughs> slide. And I was quite impressed with yeah. the climate round table that she has internally, right? There is very uh, um, diversified in terms of the group that you engage internally, but also externally. So yes, I think again, identifying your stakeholders uh, as you did and start working with them and thinking outside of the box because it might not be, you know, the most, uh, uh, the ones that you're most used to engage. Yes, yes, yes. Y como, y como lo, lo mencioné, o sea, primero nuestras yes, partes. as I mentioned, first our stakeholders, we need, we need to, uh, convince them first. Uh, Rachel mentioned it too. We have uh, the infrastructure areas at the airports, operational safety, airport security operations, financial sustainability, where together with them, we sit down on the table and we discuss between all of them what projects we can achieve and that these projects have 
a financial model according to the needs of the airport and according to the financial situations we have. That is the main point. And then we need to uh, forge different alliances, call in the different entities, sit down with, the, with business and the government, because we're all in the same page here. We're all in the same boat here. And in Colombia, all companies are working on this. And as follow up, uh, we're following up on these public private companies. So this is why we have achieved these projects. We did not did it. We, we, we didn't, we did not do this by ourselves. You saw with the companies we've been working on, including the government. They are, they are helping us to comply with our goals or objectives. So let us, let us go out there and any alert, any emergency, raise your hand and let's get together because in, in our common tables, they listen to us, we hear them, we hear them out and we come up with good proposals. And this makes it that the financial economic part is, is supported a bit with one single target or goal. Thank you, Tania. I don't know if John or Rachel would like to add something. Um, I think for me, I'd just like to say, I think it's, it's an excellent example of best practice in using collaboration to drive action. Um, very impressive. And I, I think it's good to, to share this as an example of best practice that other airports and, and as Tanya said, other organizations more widely can, can use as an example for, um, for getting that uh, commitment and input to, to um, moving forward with adaptation. Absolutely agree. Absolutely agree. Thank you. Well, unfortunately, we don't have time for, for more questions. We uh, invite all the participants to send the questions to for the speakers and we will forward it to them uh, after the webinar. Uh, we really want to thank you for uh, sharing your experience and, and for your time preparing the slides. And Rafael, I don't only want to uh, give some closing remarks before finishing the, the webinar. No, thank you very much, Francisco, and especially thank you very much, Rachel, John, and Tania for your time. And obviously to all participants that we've had, uh, I've seen more than 90 uh, for a long time. Uh, this truly tells us this is an important issue or topic for our region. Many people outside Latin America think or believe that the environment, uh, climate change aspects somehow are not important in Latin America. Maybe that was the case a, a few years ago, but at this point in time, I can assure you, they are important. And in fact, for ACI in Latin America, they're among the two most important issues or, or topics for our region, because we suffer these problems concurrently. John, thank you very much for mentioning the Caribbean Bank, Caribbean Development Bank, because together with ACI, we're working with these multilateral institutions like the Caribbean Development Bank, Inter-America, IDB, World Bank, all of these institutions. So they will assist us or uh, give us a hand, especially in those countries that don't have much financial capacity to assume or uh, work on these investments. For those of ACI that is still connected, those members of, the, of ACI, please, any point, any issue, any topic you would like to divide in different webinars, let us know. We are here for you to assist you as much as possible. And once again, Rachel, Rachel Juliana, John, Tanya, thank you very much. Thank you very much to everyone. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Gracias. Thank you. Have a nice day. Bye-bye. Bye. Ciao. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Ciao. Mm -hmm. Have a good day, night, afternoon, evening. <laughs>
Thank you.